In this commentary series, I've been talking about the reliability of the transmission of the ancient texts of the Bible. In the aftermath of the great controversy last week over the movie Noah, I've got several people asking me questions about how do we know the content of the Bible? That is, what books belong in the Bible? Um, how do we know what the canon of scripture is? Canon is just a technical term meaning a rule of a list of books, what belongs and what doesn't. Well, that's an excellent question, so I, I want to address that um, by talking about two things in this brief commentary. Um, one of the more common notions in our day, uh, popularized a few years ago by Dan Brown in his book, The Da Vinci Code, is that uh, the church just sort of arbitrarily uh, drew up a list of what books belong in the New Testament and decreed it for the church, thereby suppressing other books that certain groups had written, like the Gnostics. Um, of the early centuries. They wrote their own gospels and their own scriptures, and the church uh, essentially uh, suppressed them and kept them out of the Bible unjustly. Uh, and so the idea is that Emperor Constantine in the fourth century calls together all of the churches uh, at the Council of Nicaea, and it is there that orthodoxy uh, is created and enforced. There's only, there's a few problems with that. Number one, at the Council of Nicaea, the church did no such thing. As a matter of fact, no ecumenical council, no universal council of the church ever, ever addressed the question of what the canon of scripture is. There are a few regional councils where they drew up the list of books, incidentally, the 27 books that we actually have in our New Testament, but no ecumenical council ever addressed the question, certainly not in the fourth century, because by that time, everyone knew there were 27 books in the New Testament, no more and no less. Now, um, I want to illustrate for you just how pervasive and widespread this understanding of the church was by the fourth century. By the way, an understanding that never came about because somebody decreed it from on high. This was not a top-down, we're going to define what books are in the Bible. This was an organic, bottom-up, these are the books that Christians read uh, in, their, in their worship. Uh, in the 320s, uh, Emperor Constantine uh, wrote to Eusebius of Caesarea. Eusebius was a great church historian, and he requested and commissioned from Eusebius three, or excuse me, 50 uh, Bibles, bound Bibles for use in the church in Rome. Now, making books in the ancient world is a difficult task. You have to actually have scribes hand copy out uh, uh, texts, hand copied Bibles. So Eusebius accepts the commission, He's going to make 50 copies of the Bible for Emperor Constantine. We actually have the letter that Constantine wrote to Eusebius requesting these Bibles. We have Eusebius's response to Constantine uh, in response to this request. And do you know what Eusebius never asks the emperor? What books do you want me to include in your 50 Bibles? Think about that for a second. The emperor of the, of the known world says, make me some Bibles, and Eusebius did not find it necessary to clarify or make sure what books he wants me to include. What does that tell you? What that tells us is that in the 320s, there was no doubt whatsoever in the minds of anybody what books belonged in the Bible, which is why Eusebius created these 50 Bibles with the 66 books that we have in our Bibles today, because this was not uh, an issue of contention that the church had to invent a canon for in the 320s. Uh, the canon of scripture was well established and well understood uh, by that time, and it was not uh, some kind of totalitarian act by power-hungry church leaders, as Dan Brown would have it. Another question arose, there are these other texts, these other books, uh, the Book of Enoch, for example, which we talked about in connection with the movie Noah. Um, there's a, tr uh, a thing that's troubling to some people is that the book of Jude in the New Testament actually quotes the book of Enoch. 
Uh, doesn't that mean that Enoch has the, the uh, authority of Scripture? Why is it not equally uh, an inspired book, inspired by God, and treated that way among God's people? Well, I just want to say one thing about that. Be careful of how you interpret somebody quoting somebody else. Because the mere act of quoting somebody says just about nothing as to the level of authority being invested in that citation. I can imagine, I've written hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of blog posts uh, in my life where I have quoted the Bible uh, and appealed to the Bible as an authority. I want you to imagine for a moment that for whatever reason, I'm certainly not famous enough, but let's just, let's just pretend. 2,000 years from now, somebody digs up the archive of Dr. Brian Matson's writings. He digs up the archive and they see that in a blog post, I am quoting the Bible and they say, oh, see, he believes the Bible is God's word. And in that same blog post, I say, as Tim Keller says in his book, The Reason for God, and then I quote Tim Keller, I can see somebody 2,000 years from now saying, well, obviously, Matson thinks that Tim Keller is on a level with the Bible. Would that be a reasonable conclusion? Of course not. Merely citing something says nothing about the level of authority being invested in the citation. So be very careful about how you understand and treat Jude's citation of Enoch. Uh, it isn't as simple as it seems. Uh, we very well may be misunderstanding Jude if we say that because he quoted it, he believes it to belong in the Bible. Uh, rest assured, the canon of scripture uh, is not something that is wholly uncertain, something that we need to worry about because of the existence of these other books. The church has uh, pretty much universally accepted the 66 books of the Bible that are in the Bible that you have. So take up and read.